Okay. So welcome everyone. It is seven o'clock. So um, it is time to start the meeting. So I will right here and continue to add people. So thank you for joining us for this week's ACS Monterey Bay chapter meeting. My name is Brian Fan. I'm the president of ACS Monterey Bay chapter. Um, I'm excited about this month's meeting about blue whales from Baja, California. So I'm very excited for this month's meeting with uh, Diane. Um, if you're new here and you do not know what we are about, we host monthly meetings about whales, dolphins, porpoises, and other critters surrounding the marine ecosystem. If you're here today, it means that you're passionate about nature and that you have a thirst for knowledge, especially science from the scientists themselves. And I thank you for that. I thank you for joining us and I welcome you to our meeting. Um, if you want more information to, and want to sign up for our emails, um, feel free to go to our website at acsmb.org and also think about becoming a member for our society. All memberships do help us as a society to continue to grow and to host these meetings for you. Um, so um, signing up for our membership as well as our news outlets, so our uh, emails allows you to be updated on everything that we are doing um, and our upcoming events. So amazing science is happening every day. And if you want to contribute to that science, feel free to go to our website. Once again, it is acsmb.org to donate. We will put it into the chat um, for a link if you want to click on it. Um, your donation helps our graduate students from the uh, around the Monterey Bay. Your donation helps fund grants that we give out to our local students with their research, so master's to PhD students, anything and everything does help. So think about donating, also think about signing up for our newsletters. I also like to keep everyone updated about what's happening here in the Monterey Bay. Uh, so Gray whales are still heading up north to Alaska. So we're seeing the northbound migration of our gray whales. And you might still see them from shore. Um, I was out at a Silomar a couple of days ago, and I just looked out and I saw spouts of gray whales close to shore um, heading up north. And then there have been reports, and I've seen them myself, humpback whales are starting to come back into the Monterey Bay. So the, the start of their feeding season here. So we get to see hungry, hungry humpbacks and that's always exciting. And then there have been reports about once a week of orca coming into the bay to explore. So if you uh, want to see more orca, April and May is our orca season. So uh, highest chances of seeing orca here in the Monterey Bay. So that's really, really exciting. Um, especially since um, you might see some interesting feeding behaviors because why they're here is they're feeding on the gray whale calves that are doing their migration up north. So the moms and calves are coming by. And then of course, with our deep canyon here, the orca is a, the orcas lie in wait in deep water to attack them. So um, if you like orca, you like whales, you know, next couple of weeks and months are gonna be quite exciting when it comes to just whale watching in general. So come join us um, or anyone out to go whale watching or even from shore. So I, I, like I said before, I do like to keep everyone updated about what's happening in the Bay. And then let me introduce our speaker. So Diane Ginjone has conducted research on cetaceans in particular monitoring blue whales in the Gulf of California and West Coast of Baja California, which was the basis of her PhD thesis at CICESE -E Ensenada, where she graduated in 2003. During this period, and along with 50 other postgraduate students, she studied different biological aspects of blue whales at an individual level through a photo identification method that produced a unique blue whale sighting history of over 700 blue whales linked to a detailed database of individual information such as sex, maternal lineage, age class, female reproductive state, along with a variety of biological samples. This data set has been instrumental in estimating population parameters and validating new health parameters. Other aspects include abundance of survival estimates, distribution patterns, genetic variability, health assessments, and physiological plasticity, um, endocrine physiology, 
feeding habits, acoustic studies, and human-related whale watching impacts. Parallel to her research, she has shared her knowledge with the general public through particip participation in several documentaries, BBC National History Unit, National Geographic, and more interviews and podcasts. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Diane. Um, so I will allow you to, to pause mine, sorry. Let's do stop share, and then I will allow you to share, and it's all you. Okay, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> before, uh, did I share it? Yes. I did, okay. <clears throat> uh, before I start, I, I really sincerely hope that everybody is finding happiness through this uh, year of change and also uh, having more compassion with people that are kind of struggling right now. So just a little thought I wanted to share with you. Uh, <clears throat> as you heard, uh, Brian, most of my dedication is... is um, uh, towards the ecology of cetacean is basically on, on blue whale individual, uh, but I've been asked to include the fin whale. So it was, a, it was an interesting, uh, um, how could I say, exercise for me, because we did uh, use fin whale to compare with blue whale in some aspect of their biology. So <clears throat> I'll try to include that um, in this presentation. Uh, also, before I start, I'd like to uh, thank, because, uh, you know, I put my name as the presenter, but this work, um, part of this work I will, I will uh, present to you has been done with many collaborators and many, many students. I'm just naming some of them. Um, <clears throat> some of them I've chosen. Uh, some of what they've done, but it's not a just one person uh, study. It's a very, very uh, complex student and different um, collaborators. So I wanted to be put that clear before. And also, um, I want to thank American Cetacean uh, Society because in the past, they have uh, given very important and useful grant for the student to uh, complete their TC. So um, I, I want to apologize. I, I want to uh, acknowledge that right now. Okay. Anyway, so fin whales and blue whales, they're similar species in size. They're sister species in the same family of the roar quals. Uh, blue whale is uh, more light and fin whales are much more dark in, in their pigmentation, in their skin pigmentation. Uh, one is seasonal. The blue whale uh, only come in the Gulf uh, during the winter. It's actually a winter uh, feeding ground. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the, the fin whale is a resident population of the Gulf California, very interesting. Uh, large whale that continue to feed and find food all year round in the Gulf. And blue whale are specialized, feeding mainly on krill, while fin whales are more generalists. They will feed on krill, but also on small fish like uh, sardine type, clupate types. I show that pictures because <clears throat> I just want to uh, bring your attention to these uh, green, line, green lines, which are marine traffic, uh, huge cargo traffic in the, in the North Pacific in that, in that case, and how the Gulf California compared to Vancouver or California, Northern California, Southern California, it's, it's like a, a refugee, a refuge, I would say, <clears throat> for uh, for these whales. And I think that could have an impact on 
may be the help of the fin whale uh, in general, because if they're resident, they're, they're living in, an, in a habitat that has not so much noise and problems with uh, collision, et cetera. As, <clears throat> as it happens with blue whales a lot in California, as you know. Okay. <clears throat> For blue whale, which migrate, <clears throat> this picture, I mean, this graph, this results from the group of Bruce made out of Oregon State University, I think represent quite well, you know, where and how far north and how far south these well go. <clears throat> so it was taught many, many years ago that the blue whales from the Gulf of California were migrating to basically California. But that was changed with these um, <clears throat> with these satellite tags that permitted to understand a little bit more how uh, more uh, larger their migration is not is not a it, 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 it's not just California Gulf California but some whales goes all the way down to Costa Rica Dome and other whales migrate all the way to the Gulf of Alaska so. <clears throat> in terms of uh, movement is, is, is much more wider. Um, <clears throat> okay, for blue whale in general, Gulf California is a very special nursing, feeding, calving area. It's unique in the world because of all the data we've been gathering for almost 30 years now. And uh, because it's a winter calving area, we know some of the, of the individuals since they're born. I mean, we photograph them since they're <clears throat> uh, with their mom. And so we can follow them all the way through their lives. And several of them right now are about <clears throat> 27 years, 25 years old. And obviously we'll take another <clears throat> another group or a continuation of what we've been doing to understand, um, you know, a larger part of their life because uh, I'm not 30 years old. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so let's look at a little bit about the abundance. How many blue whales do come to the Gulf? Um, it is a uh, it is a, a subject we're still working on. Uh, in my PhD thesis, I did an estimate based on several aerial survey. As you can see here, all the right, uh, red lines are transect, mostly uh, from airplane, but also from boats. You can see our different boats, including the Puma from Yunnan, <laughs> and mainly from a very little Cessna <laughs> uh, from Sandy Lenham, uh, owner of Sandy Lanham, where we, we, we did many, many, many hours of searching in the Gulf. Anyway, so up to 2006, the estimate um, I reached was around 300 individual annually. But uh, we've, been, we've been doing more survey up to 2013 and we were still working on, you know, uh, putting all this thing together and see variation between periods because <clears throat> this, this uh, period include, you know, the 90s, the 2000 and the 2010. And I think we will, we, we will be able to see some change in there. So 300 blue whales, more or less with, with, a, with a wide interval, you know, between, 150 to 500 or 600 animals per year. But that is <clears throat> a lot less than what is estimate of uh, for the Northeast Pacific population. So <clears throat> it's obvious that not all the blue whales come in the Gulf during winter. Some of them we know now stay up north, but others go to the Costa Rica Dome and maybe uh, another place we still don't know yet. So all the blue, blue dots are one sighting of one or more blue whales on effort. We were always doing transect kind of line. 
<clears throat> you can see that along the coast between Loreto and La Paz is totally blue <laughs> because it's the area we, where we, uh, we did more, most of our survey during the last 30 years. And if we compare with fin whales, uh, they're, they're more, more distributed along the coast. I just did a, a very gross <clears throat> area where they, they're not so much in the middle of the Gulf. They're more coastal, although you can see them close to San Pedro Martir, but they, they use more the, the, the coastal area, both sides, Guaymas, even south, and Bayaquino, which is famous for fin whales there. So they share the Gulf during seasonally when blue whales are in the Gulf. <clears throat> and then they, 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 they don't share the whole Gulf. Yeah, as you can see, there's a little bit of difference in their habitat. Uh, okay. So that's an example of the survey we, we've been doing between La Paz and Loreto every year, every single year for many, many years. <clears throat> and that was possible because of the small but continuous funds from the, the university where I am work with, Sisimara is in La Paz. And <clears throat> we're based, I mean, we're part of the National Polytechnic Institute. So <clears throat> every year without uh, any exception except this year, <clears throat> we had fun to be able to monitor this area um, for many, many years. You'll see I, I changed a bit the, um, the, the, the idea. From 2009, I decided to dedicate more time in the Loreto area, but basically it's these are the same whales <clears throat> migrating up and down. <clears throat> Sorry. Using acoustic, uh, which I like to present because the, the studying the sounds of blue whales in, in, in time gives you an idea when they come in the Gulf and when they leave, much more precise than what we would see in the field. For example, <clears throat> We know that that fin whale, I mean, sorry, that blue whales are already in the Gulf <clears throat> in December. We've seen blue whale in December, including in November, but they're very, very hard to study because they're just moving. They're just traveling very fast. <clears throat> so with acoustic, we can see that at the beginning of the season, well, let's say at the beginning of the winter for us, <clears throat> um, Aurora, who, uh, analyze all the data from uh, two hydrophones that were uh, anchored in the bottom of uh, two area in the Gulf, <clears throat> uh, which they call harps. And these data comes from scripts with uh, Dr. Hildebrand. And she was uh, allowed to analyze all the blue whale vocalization and see how much it's changed during the season. As, as you can see in blue, at the beginning of the season, there's more calls or <clears throat> how would you call it, cancion or more calls done by the male, which are more related to reprodu probably reproductive um, purpose. And then the red, <clears throat> which is uh, the voc vocalization D, more related to the feeding um, is present also in December, but kind of uh, take, take over after, uh, during the, the, the winter months. <clears throat> and if you compare that with California, it, it totally makes sense um, from the data that, that was analyzed <clears throat> there before. So very interesting study that uh, permitted us to confirm that blue whales were coming <clears throat> before we study them and leaving after we, we finished studying them too, so they stay a little longer. Okay, <clears throat> most of the study is based on individual sampling. Individual sampling to be able to, um, to know the individual, but also to extrapolate to the population later on. So to start 
uh, a study like that, you need to identify, to be able to identify the individual. <clears throat> Blue whales have this unique pattern of, of pigmentation, very different than fin whales, for example, as you know, probably. <clears throat> but there's many of them, and it's like looking at, at you know, hundreds and hundreds of puzzles. So we decided a couple of years ago to <clears throat> classify our catalog with the dorsal fin, you know, like uh, up and marked and hooked and chopped. And there's six types. And in each types, <clears throat> we have five different pigmentation from very light to very dark. So this classification really help us to identify much easier the individual and some of them also <clears throat> show their flukes uh, but not all of them so and as I mentioned at the beginning we can identify <clears throat> calves since their first year and the pigmentation doesn't change they might acquire marks but the under pigmentation the basis of their pigmentation stay the same so it's a, it's a very useful <clears throat> way of uh, uh, following the individual through times, knowing their age, for example. So after you, you have an idea, you think you have a match, then the pigmentation will confirm we're talking about the same well. <clears throat> so there's no, there's, it's impossible to have a, a and a mistake saying this is the same individual. It might be you didn't find it, but when you find it, there's no mistake. So it's very useful too for a lot of different type of analysis. Okay, <clears throat> coupled with the photo idea, there's other sam sample that are very useful. And then at the beginning of the research, well, I, I took the time, even if I didn't really like it, but to take biopsy, so a, a little piece of skin with a little piece of blubber, and that permit, especially with the skin, to identify the sex of the individual, and then to do many, many other kind of analysis. But basically here, um, for genetics, this, the fresh skin from a biopsy is very useful. And here at the corner, I have uh, Luis Enriquez Paredes, who's We've been, oops, sorry. We've been uh, collaborating for many years. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. This is an example of the males <clears throat> citing through the, the years. So on top you have the years. It, it might be, it's probably too small, but you know, so from 85 to 2020, and then uh, you have different individual per line. And when there's a little hole in, in the blue squares, because it means this well was identified, first identified as a calf during that year. I just want to draw your attention with these two individual which are almost always seen in the area. Very interesting. Males have a very high side fidelity, much over than what we thought before. Um, very interesting thing. For females, <clears throat> which we have many more, again, don't, don't worry about the numbers. Basically, when you have a pink square, it means we, we saw that well that year. When it's black, it's because it was with the calf. And same thing with the little hole, means it was identified as a calf during that particular year. <clears throat> and here I want to draw your attention with um, the calving interval. If you look at that particular well here, it had a calf every six year, and there was no missing possible year where we didn't see it. So this whale was actually having a calf every six year, which is much, much longer than what we know in general. A female would have a calf every two years or every three years. 
And in, in, um, in general, we, we, we were talking about around three years, you know, when you do the, um, uh, an average, an average of the calving interval. <clears throat> so same thing, there's many female who are highly fidel, have high site fidelity to the area. Others are coming and not seen, and anyway, it, it varies a lot. I also want to draw your attention <clears throat> that during the, let's say the last eight years, we have much less numbers of calves compared to the period before. And I will discuss that a little, little bit later. Okay, another um, information we gather, <clears throat> taking the photo idea, but from the head all the way to the end, and if there's a fluke, even better. And uh, Christian Ortega, he developed a method to measure individual at sea using these pictures, these photographs with a laser range finder, and then, you know, uh, different distance with the, the zoom, if it was uh, 300 or 100 or whatever. So he was able to show uh, that it's possible to uh, measure the whale. We compare that with aerial photograph and the length of the boat with the whales. And basically there's, it looks like there's an error of, of, of about one meter, <clears throat> which is not that much when you think about the size of these whale, which can reach 26, 25, 27 meter long. <clears throat> so using the modal progression analysis, he could uh, kind of uh, separate um, the individual into age class. Okay, more sample. I mean, we've, we've talked about the photo idea, the biopsy, where we can have a piece of skin, piece of blubber. With this, we can do all these analysis. There's also another type of skin that we can collect, which is the slough skin, the, 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 the skin that the whale shed normally. Um, very interesting because using this coupled with the skin, the fresh skin, it was possible to, um, we'll see that a little bit later, it's possible to, to look at where the whales, where the whales have been feeding having three different types of, of skin, the, 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 the slough skin, the, the upper one, mid, and the close to the, the, the blood, close to the blood. The feces, I would say, feces are the, the best gift that the well give us, because we, with these, we can do so many things. Uh, Every every certain time, looking at the result, we have I have new idea about what, what else we can do, and it's it's really getting very very interesting. I'm just gonna give you some example, and then the the spout or the blow, blow contain uh, bacteria, uh, fungus, and virus, and it could be a way to look at. Uh, Pathog well, pathogen in general, also hormones. Other people have done very hard work and uh, assessed hormone from the, the blow of the whales. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the feeding uh, habits. It's something that has been interesting me for a long time. Actually, I came to Mexico to do my master because I wanted to verify <clears throat> if blue whales were really feeding all the time or just opportunistically. And I wanted to understand why some years blue whales were not very abundant and other years they were very abundant. And then I learned about the El Nino. Anyway, so it was, it was my master thesis. Uh, so from the feces, <laughs> which you can see here, these, these kind of trunk, or I don't know how to call that, um, when they're disturbed by the wind or waves, they, 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 uh, they disintegrate into a fine powder. And uh, looking at the, at the feces as per se, 
the only thing I could find was this thing. And I looked and looked and looked, what could that be for a long time until I realized these were mandibles of euphosids. And then I realized they were even a key to identify different species from the mandible. And also from the mandible, you can estimate the size of the krill they eat. So it's amazing. Just with that little, little mandible, you can do a lot of uh, analysis of you know, what, they're, what part of the, the krill size they're feeding on. Anyway, so that, that's what we were encountering most of the time. There was like maybe one or two um, mictophid otolites, otolites, <clears throat> but I thought it was like, you know, uh, not like, like uh, uh, something in the sample, but not, not uh, so abundant. Anyway, <clears throat> then I decide, well, let's look at what what blue whales feed, because I mean, let's confirm that they feed only on krill, comparing uh, the DNA of the prey from blue whales and, and fin whales taken in the Gulf during the winter. And we were very surprised, whoops, to, found, to find that mictophid is part of their, their, their feeding habit as, as, as well as fin whales but in a lesser uh, in importance in terms of the, of the DNA of the mitophid present in the feces. So that was really interesting because if you, if you read any book, they will, you will learn that blue whales only feed on krill and very seldom, very rarely, they also feed on squid or kind of different kind of fish, but very rarely. So I was wondering, is that a recent shift? Is, or is it just in the Gulf of California? So there's many, many more uh, question that um, comes out from this little research we did. It was a student actually, uh, Christina. Okay, so we found that they don't only feed on, on krill. And then <clears throat> we use this, this idea of the well pup. I'm sure you've heard about that. It's been very famous in, research in Antarctica and also with the, the right whales in the North Atlantic. And so we wanted to show uh, <clears throat> how much the feces of blue whale could increase the productivity, the phytoplankton productivity in the Loreto area where we mostly work now. So a student did an experiment with a bottle of water in the, in the at sea anchor, and they, uh, she had a little bit and then a little bit more uh, feces in it. And what you can see here is after four days, <clears throat> the, uh, the chlorophyll uh, increased uh, dramatically with the, with the, 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 the I mean, the, the more feces that was added to the, the container. Anyway, and, and then even that there's another peak there. And then we also did the primary productivity on that. And we look at the acidity, we look at the, the I mean, the pH. And basically what we could uh, conclude from that is that feces, blue whale feces contain nutrients that enhance phytoplankton. I mean, there is bacteria con contained in the feces that transform the nutrient, which is readily available and useful for the phytoplankton. It was very, very interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> then we, uh, we also analyze uh, the micronutrients or the trace element like copper, zinc, um, uh, what's that? Hierro, hierro, no, hierro is uh, iron, cadmium, and manganese. And as you can see, it, this is a, a, an average of all the feces taken different, different years and how <clears throat> these uh, concentration change with time. And so we also looked at what, you know, what, uh, kind of trace element was composed the mctophid and the krill and, and interestingly the mctophid basically are composed of these two 
not so much iron and copper and zinc, eh, contrarily to the krill. So we believe that there are shifts in the feeding habit uh, that we cannot see just observing the whale, obviously, not even looking, only looking at the feces, but we need to do more of this uh, 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 genetic analysis, uh, DNA analysis from the feces to look at all the possible prey. Okay, <clears throat> slough skin and skin, uh, has, has been part of uh, a lot of research in, in Sissimar, including uh, Geraldine Busquet um, theses, master theses, and PhD theses. And this is one of the publications that came out using the different layer of the skin. Like I said, this externum, spinosium, and ba basal of the skin <clears throat> plus the, the, the slough skin, and she could determine easily the different isotope base uh, ecosystem where the whales were migrating, even to Costa Rica. But most importantly and interestingly, and she started to do something similar, but using uh, baleen from dead animal. In the baleen plates, uh, she calculated that you can gather about three years of data, three longitude year of data. And she looked at the isotope through the baleen and found very interesting data such as this. For example, here we have the, the, the area of the, the isotope nitro, 15 nitrogen, very high in the Gulf, Costa Rica, I mean, coastal California current system and Costa Rica don't. And she, and she can show that females do move from the feeding summer area to the, the winter area, right? Close to the Gulf, close to Costa Rica. But several males looks like they don't migrate during these three years period. So <clears throat> this is very interesting. So using another type of sample, Obviously, it's from a dead animal, but it gives us so much information through a longitudinal data set of the last three years of the animal before he died. So that gives us a complete different picture of, of our understanding of the blue whale. Um, okay, now I, I would like to share with you some some parameters that I thought could be interesting to look at the general health of the individual. Um, <clears throat> and the first, the first one that we really uh, work on was with Karina Acevedo Whitehouse, looking at the, at the pathogen in, in, the, in the spout of the, of, the, of the whales. Actually, there were several whales we sampled. And then we proved that with this article that it was feasible, feasible to collect the, the, the blow of, of the, the blue whales with this, and this type was not a drone, it was an helicopter. It was very difficult to maneuver, but we could prove that it was possible to do it. But now after several years as a student who developed um, a, a different way of collecting, well, similar, using a drone, much easier. <clears throat> and uh, you have here the Petri dish and other type of uh, lamina to look at, at the bacteria and other things, and other, and other things that you could um, sample. And so I don't wanna uh, talk too much about his result because he just finished and he's currently, I think his, his paper is in re revision. So I don't wanna, show too much data. I think it's more to him to present that, but I just wanted to share with you. <clears throat> so using this next generation sequencing, he got an incredible amount of bacteria classes that he found and he used a very complicated analysis to look at uh, diversity, richness, different type of diversity. And anyway, he concluded that the core microbiome of blue whale 
uh, for, for the 20 individual ES sample, there was about 12 classes of bacteria. So it's like a, the first step to look at <clears throat> how this could change in the future. There was some, uh, actually two individuals that had very different type of bacteria and they totally um, separate from the rest of the individual. We still don't have uh, enough data to know to uh, conclude anything about them. That's, that's, that's a shame. Um, anyway, I'll you'll, you'll see what I mean later. <clears throat> okay, we also look with Karina at, uh, and, and a student at the effect of UV on the skin of uh, whales in general. <clears throat> Obviously, blue whales were, were in our in interest, but we compare with uh, sperm whale and fin whale. Sperm whale because it dive for a long time, but also stay at surface for a long time in the sun. <clears throat> and fin whales and totally different coloration of, uh, with blue whales. So, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and we also started to, to, to see those kind of blister. Uh, that's one hypothesis that these could be blister caused by the sun, but it could also be caused by bacteria and other things. The idea of the research was using the skin, using genetic to look at, first look at melanocyte and then look at uh, other things to, to, to compare between species. And here she found very interesting, and that's um, Laura Martinez Levasa. <clears throat> she found very interesting result. I just want to point the attention here that that we found with blue whales because we had more data and, and much more data than fin whales or, or sperm whale, obviously, that the um, the mitochondrial DNA lesion that she found increase with age of the animal. I already told, told you about we, some of the individual, we know the exact age. Well, these are the example of these individual that were uh, skin biopsy. So she could do the study on that. Very interesting. So with the age, <clears throat> it increased the number of the lesion uh, in the, the mitochondrial DNA. Okay, now we got we get to the the feces, which I I told you it's the 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 most important gift that blue well could give us. So one student <clears throat> adapt a very common uh, technique to look to look at numbers of parasites eggs in cows and and sheep, and she adapt that to the blue well uh, feces. <clears throat> the, the first uh, experiment she did so she could find she could count the number of eggs and basically element eggs and she could also describe some of the uh, adult uh, seen in the feces but then then <clears throat> she used all the sample available hundreds from blue whales and 44 from fin whales and she compared the the, the mean intensity of the egg per gram per, per feces. And as you can see, blue whales have <clears throat> apparently more um, eggs, element eggs than fin whales, but also 100% of them, this means all of the blue whale sample add eggs in their feces compared to only 61 with, with fin whale. So that's another example of comparing blue whales with, with a similar species like fin whales give us some insight of, of you know, uh, it, it's more interesting to understand, it's, it's more interesting to discuss and, and, and I would say more uh, knowledgeable because, because, because you include another species. So. Another <clears throat> type of analysis is uh, assessment of hormones, steroid hormone and glucocorticoid hormones in feces. That was done <clears throat> before by the group that works on in the North Atlantic at, um, right well. <clears throat> but I, I, I wanted to find a way to preserve these sample much easier than to freeze them because here in Baha'i, it's so hot. It's very difficult to uh, always have um, 
ni nitrogen, uh, liquid nitrogen tanks and all that. So <clears throat> because when I, I look at the, at the feces to look at what they feed on, I remember that the sample would dry very fast. So I decided to try uh, dehydrating the sample on the site, on the boat, on, on, on our small boat after uh, sampling it. And a student did the analysis of progesterone on about 17 whales, uh, most, of, uh, most of them, most of them except one male and two that we didn't know the sex <laughs> were sample. And if you look at how old, I mean, the, the, the first year we saw these whales or uh, that had calves uh, showed us that they were basically all mature whales, females. So it was perfect for the analysis. And also the, the, we had uh, seven lactating male to compare and one mature male also to compare. <clears throat> well, she found that five of them were pregnant, the, 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 the uh, concentration of progesterone was way high than lactating or resting female. And then we calculate about 22% of these mature female were pregnant. That's just a number from the top of my head that came out with that, which is kind of what we would expect if uh, not every wells are receptive because they don't they don't produce a cap every year. There's always a lack of female per year that are receptive, right? <clears throat> anyway, so that was very interesting to prove that we could do that and, all, and also, well, prove that they were also pregnant in the Gulf. And also one glucocorticoid, the only one we found that vary with, with the sample was corticosterone. And interestingly, it was higher in the pregnant female. I, I, you know, at first I thought maybe the lactating female are more stressed, but it appeared to be the case with other mammal, land mammal, and other uh, other whales too. So this was really interesting because now we have um, we have a, a a reference parameter especially for the corticosterone. If we want to look at you know, general stress in the future, we have some reference to what it, what it is with pregnant and non-pregnant female, for example. Obviously there's much more work to, to be done with the, with the males and, and other individual, but it, it's the start of, of this big study we want to do. Uh, also with blubber. <laughs> Uh, with Shannon, Shannon Atkinson in, in Fairbank, Alaska. <clears throat> we did um, the same kind of analysis uh, using the blubber from the biopsy. And with a complicated, but not complicated, but with a more precise model, Trevor Branch did uh, get to an estimate of 33.4% of the, uh, as a pregnancy rate. But interestingly, the same with the, the, the feces result, very few females were from these, uh, these females were seen the year after with a calf. That is un understandable because we don't see the in, all the individual every year. And, but still the number of female that came back that were not seen with a calf was kind of, uh, suspicious. So we don't know exactly what is happening. Uh, it looks like females are getting pregnant, but they don't complete the pregnancy uh, uh, giving birth to a, to a cat always. Okay, <clears throat> for fin whales, uh, Erika Caron did also in, in collaboration with, with Shannon Atkinson in, uh, in Alaska, <clears throat> she looked at the progesterone and testosterone of the fin whales that were sampled uh, during the year, but there's, there, there was some, um, some, some period where, where we didn't have sample, but what she found is really interesting. And she made a, a, a diagram of how, how the breeding season of fin whale may, uh, occurring, may be occurring in the Gulf. So, 
they found courtship and high testosterone uh, during the summer <clears throat> with females with low progesterone, but also uh, not the same season, not the same year, but the same season, other female with very high um, progesterone. So the idea from that and also uh, weaning of a calf that was observed, the, uh, the idea is that the uh, uh, reproduction probably occurred uh, the conception or mating probably occurred during summer fall and with the gestation and, and it, it, it's its range of error um, <clears throat> would make it would, would make the 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 small one to be born probably in fall and then uh, females with the calf would be in the most productive uh, season to feed the calf and feed themselves too. Anyway, very interesting work. And she could conclude with that, that uh, these resident female are not uh, breeding all year round, but they lo it looks like it, it, that their, their, their seasonal breeder as the same as Blue Whale, for example, or Unpack or Grey Whale. Okay, time is running very fast. Um, I want to talk about this uh, body condition. Uh, in 2015, we start to see whales with uh, uh, emaciated whale, and uh, everybody was having the same feeling that most of the whale were emaciated. And it was during 2015 when we had uh, this big blog on the Pacific and in, in March when we sampled, this this was around Baja. <clears throat> so maybe that in effect, maybe it was the El Nino plus that. Anyway, it did make a difference. And so a student developed a body uh, index, body condition index similar to what was published with right whales and gray whales before. She took uh, into consideration vertebral process, postcranial depression, and lateral depression. And she analyzed <clears throat> all the pictures since we were using, since, since the digital picture up to now. I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't find the graph with 2019 and 20. But what you can see is from 2015, the, the normal uh, condition of well really dropped and uh, the, the poor condition of, uh, increased. And uh, I thought that, that would last maybe a year or two, but uh, it was apparent until uh, 2019 when we start to see a little bit more recu recuperation, but um, completely, completely known. There's still individual that show poor condition. For example, this is <clears throat> different individual with their evaluation of condition. And you can see some of them are not coming back. I mean, red a little bit, but um, it's it's kind of sad to see. And, and sad to see also that most of the, the highly fidel males are the one that seems to be uh, less, uh, less recuperate. They don't really recuperate. Meanwhile, very few female came during this year. These male were there in their post and, and didn't leave the area. And, and they were feeding because we had some sample of feces, but the, the, the density was probably not enough for the female anyway. Okay, so what, I'm, what we're trying to do now with all this is to try to, <clears throat> to use this basic uh, visual body condition, you no know, good condition, good condition, and then less good condition, coupled with blow results, uh, hormones, and also um, uh, the the uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the almond eggs and change in the diet, and so to try to have a, a more complete story to explain why these well were so. Um, so uh, emaciate and for such a long time. Anyway, so we're working on that. It's not easy because <laughs> some feces were taken way long ago and fixed with enanol, but the sun dry with the hormone, I just had the ID in 19, uh, 2009, sorry. And the blow sampling only. So it's not all together the same kind of uh, uh, sampling, but I think we can get to a proxy of, of 
of all these things together. Okay, I just want to finish with a very positive <clears throat> story. The, actually, just before I, I got into uh, this, this link for, to give the talk, there's a French uh, peer, a journalist that sent me an email and she wanted me to review you know, the whale watching in Mexico, especially with blue whale. She said, I've been in Loreto maybe 15 years ago, 12 years ago. And I was, uh, I was really shocked by the way uh, the whale watching was done. So now I can tell you and I'll show you how it happened. <clears throat> um, the whale watching in Loreto is a very different story. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so blue whale were, were part of the, of the PASI in Mexico, which is Programa de Acción, Action, Program of Action to Conserve Species, right? So we had a meeting and we, we, we show all what we knew and basically the, the, the development in the Loreto area, bringing more tourists to see whales were, was what we thought was the more, most um, urgent action to, uh, to do. So my idea was to promote collaboration because I was sure that if, if the idea was to tell to the, the fishermen that because most of them were fishermen before, the fish, the fish went down a bit and they, they decided uh, to do an alternative kind of trip with, with the whales. But uh, I was sure that the only way was to, to collaborate, not, not to come and tell what to do. Right, and so it was important to start a study uh, on the effect of whale watching. Is there an effect really, and it's not easy to do. So the only way I found possible was to do focal animal survey, and I was inspired, especially with the study uh, on the elephant by Dr. Poole, looking for males. You know, uh, every every uh, following a male every every day to see what he was doing. And I thought, well, I'm not sure if I can do that with blue whales, but we try and it worked. And we use again the, the Loreto area because the whales are close to shore. Uh, it was cheap. I, we, we were living on my sailboat, working in, in the small panga. It was cheap and we could do, we could really start this, this work. So basically, <clears throat> Because we knew the individual, and we also have a catalog of the of the resident, not resident, but the the most common wells that comes every year, we were able to when we follow an an individual to know almost instinct right away if it was a male or female or something else, you know. And so the idea was to not interact with the well, neither with the well watching boat, in a very passive way. I don't believe in following the individual to look at the behavior because I'm sure by following, you also uh, interact with it. So basically <clears throat> from far away using binoculars, using computer, mini computer to have really a good track of the movement, a very precise, accurate dive and surface time and all this. And uh, so we started this, this study. And also when there were boats around, we wouldn't, put the numbers of both, the speed they were going, basically uh, that. I mean, there's many other data that can be done, but I found it was like too complicated. And we were, we were making a mistake more than having really uh, good data. And so we look at different behaviors, surface feeding, circling at surface, which means they're feeding on the bottom, uh, mothers and calves interaction, interaction with pairs, female, males, and anyway, surface feeding. And this is an example. Each color is a, is a follow of, of several hours, more than two hours, sometimes up to 10 hours. And you can see some of the individual, like this blue one here, never, never move from the area. We probably stay motor off all day looking at it. Anyway, so these are the different uh, patterns. Um, also, in general, we saw that blue whales are much more social than we think. You know, when you when you look read in books, they always say blue whales are solitary. They're social because often, if you follow in, in one individual, it'll bring you to other individual. It's really amazing, and also uh, you you have individual 
coming in the area and they come right by us with the well where we were, where, 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 that we are following. So there's obviously a, a, a calling and, and sounds that are produced there. Anyway, courtship was seen, interaction between males were seen, but not very often. It's a very long-term study to study, you know, <laughs> behavior of, of whales. And we also found a small-scale social structure looking at the, the at the using microsatellites in in between females. They were more related than than not. So very interesting. Okay, so basically it's a you know the Gulf California, but particularly Loreto, where there's well watching, it's a critical habitat because the mom nurse their calf, they, they do mate, and then it's also a feeding area. So for the whale watching, it was important to tell them that. So what we did, we present this graph, easy to understand, where when there's whale watching, for example, uh, here, this is the, the, the average of the, the, the dive time compared to the whale alone. Same thing with surface time, less, less longer when there's whale watching. So we present that, we discuss that with the captain and they were, they were a little bit uh, concerned because they knew the individual and they knew they come every year and they knew they stay for a long time, sometimes two months. So they understood they, 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 they had to take a little bit, take action in the way they were doing uh, their, their well watching. So we went at sea, we shared experience, we had fun, we discussed, we, we talked about the truth, how they were doing things. Anyway, it was, it was, it was really nice to, to, to be able at sea, to be uh, able to discuss and, and tell the, the truth. Anyway, so after we, we present that, they decide to do our same way of studying well. They decide to stop their motor and observe. And they started that in 2014 and it was amazing. I mean, uh, it came from their, their own will to try this crazy way of, of looking at will without following them, no, without chasing them. Anyway, so we showed after 2014, 15, 16, that now we couldn't see difference between the whale watching and the natural behavior of whales. So we, we, we told them that they were going in the right direction anyway. So now there's a, there's a totally different way to observe blue whales in Loreto. It's called the passive method. It's part of the man management plan for the blue whale from the park. Everybody has to follow this, this, this way of doing things. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's much better than it was 15 years ago. And we also have put a camera, a remote camera uh, on an island that can look at the natural behavior and also the interaction with the boats. And this year we were able to connect that to the internet. So there's a link in the park where you can click on it and you can see what we see uh, with the camera. So it's, it's really cool and uh, from anywhere in the world. Okay, so I, I, I guess <clears throat> I wanted to finish with that positive study. And I do believe that long-term conservation effort comes from collaborative uh, work. And when people who use the resource as blue whale, for example, and um, and take care of it. This is the only way to have a, a real long-term conservation effort. Thank you very much. I hope it was not too long. <laughs> uh, almost an hour. Perfect, perfect. That was amazing. Learned so much about blue whales and fin whales from Baja. Um, thank you so much. Now is a perfect time for questions. If any of you have some questions, feel free to throw it into the chat. Um, that is below on your Zoom and it's just part of the chat function. And then uh, you can actually send a message to everyone, um, not just a uh, direct message to anyone. Um, I will do my best to go through the questions and yeah. So I have a question from Dan. Um, it says, if fin whales show negative signs, uh, negative for uh, eggs in the poop, is it true for all poops from the same fin whale 
was the search for fin whale poop look for uh, look at the species from the same whale over time? Could it be um, egg free one day, yet a couple of day later show positive? That's a very good question. In the uh, in the publication I, I showed uh, when I present this data, we the, there was some individual that was resampled in a consecutive day. Uh, and the data was uh, showed that it, it didn't change so much, but from a year to the other, it could change that, especially especially with blue whales. With fin with fin whale, uh, yeah, it was the same person who did the analysis. The feces of blue whale and fin whales really is very similar, same color, basically same color, same texture, a little bit different, but not so much. And the the yeah, the method was exactly the same. So yeah, we were uh, a, a, a bit uh, surprised to see that that some of the fin whale didn't have any eggs. Of course, it's an estimate, you know, using that little uh, little uh, uh, master little uh, I don't know how you call that in English. Anyway, <clears throat> so it's it's just a drops, some drops of of of, of this. Uh, feces that has been sedimented and there's different kind of, uh, you know, uh, step to do that, but it, it was the same for both species. So, yeah, it, it's, um, it's interesting. And, uh, and, and also, of course, we, we're just thinking about eggs, eggs of mostly ailment, but we found, yeah, ailment, but um, it, it, if there's eggs in the feces, it means that the, the animal has the adult somewhere in their intestine. So it, it's kind of a, a proxy of, of, you know, the way to measure something anyway. <laughs> so the next question is from George. This is, if blue whales feed exclusively on krill, is there any evidence that they be able to adapt by turning to alternative food source or move to other feeding areas during extreme marine warming? Yeah, well, good question. I can ask the same question. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I think, well, finding lantern fish in their diet, not just like occasionally, all of the 40 sample of blue whale we analyze at mictophids, I mean, lantern fish. So it's not occasional, it's not a, a you know, but um, is it because there was, there was not enough krill? Do they prefer krill? I guess so. You know, if you, if you look at the content of iron and, you know, anyway, <clears throat> content of lipid too, probably, um, but they do, go somewhere else when there's not much food around, I can tell you that. And I don't know where they go. Uh, they, they, might, uh, they might know areas better than other. They, they, oh, they just go and look for that and check them out. But yeah, it's a very good question. We, we don't really know how they find the food and how they adapt to all these change. Yeah. Uh, just a quick, uh, question to put in um, to build upon that. So are you saying that we know a lot of about blue whales in the feeding areas and in the calving areas, but not necessarily the in-between? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, no, I was saying like, for example, during a very strong El Nino, we see very, very few blue whales, but we don't know where they go during that year, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we know little, less of, of the transit because working on the West Coast is not easy. There's not many places you can go out of. We did that many years, but it, it, I mean, it's difficult. Um, yeah, uh, actually, we think that Baja California offshore could be a, a feeding area. Uh, I mean, a, a, a steady feeding area <clears throat> because half of, more than half of the individual that we know very well were not matched to California blue whale. Uh, so it means they're going somewhere else, you know, not obviously you're not gonna have all the individual match, there's mistake here and there, but to have more than half not match, it, it means something. There's a student 
Susana Ugalde, she's working on a paper of, of her PhD that she did the whole comparison of these blue whales from, from Baja California to all the blue whales of California. So I have another question from Ernest. Uh, what percentage of blue whales in the Pacific are overwintering in the Gulf of California? Well, I would say uh, less than half, probably. Uh, yeah, less than half, that's for sure. I mean, there's there's not 1,000 blue whales in the Gulf during a, a winter. It's, it's, it's more like 500 or even less. Uh, Karen is asking, how frequently do you think pregnant whales don't carry to full term? This is something very new um, that was discovered by the, the assessment of the progesterone. It's, it's very interesting. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, it's impossible to estimate that. But one thing I can tell or think, or I will share with you is that during these last six years where blue whales were kind of uh, dementiate, right? Their body condition were not so good. We didn't see much calves. And it makes sense because a, a female whale needs blubber, needs, needs to be healthy and enough, you know, with enough blubber to, to go through the gestation and then the lactation. And that was shown with fin whales from the North Atlantic, our best fin whale from the North Atlantic. We look at the, at the thickness of the, of the blubber and relate it to the, the uh, ovary, uh, the, the, the yeah, ovary uh, cycle, you know, with the, anyway, I don't know how the words right now, but anyway, so, so it was clear from that result that if the whales are not fat enough, they probably cannot uh, continue the gestation until giving the, the, the bird or the calf. Um, next question I have is, do, 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 sorry, there's lots of uh, thank you and great talks. So I'm just going through that. Um, a lot of people saying thank you for the talk. Um, and then Stephanie's question was looking at one of your graphs. It says, uh, what was going on in 2011? Um, there was a dip in the graph um, and she says it, she thinks it was with the isotopes. No, it was with the trace element. It's true and uh, it's true. There's something, something very important happened in 2011. We're still not sure, but it looks like it's around the time when the uh, Pacific oscillation is, is kind of switching. Obviously it doesn't happen in one year, but something between these two periods uh, make a change. And we're not sure yet, but maybe with more data on what they were feeding during that particular year, uh, or you know, we could we could answer a, a little bit better that yeah, it's uh, it's definitively a, a a mark between two periods. Um, Gail is asking, when is a good time to whale watch in the Gulf, um, and do the blue whales give birth in the Gulf? <clears throat> Well, the best time to, 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 to come to see blue whales in Loreto is February, March. February, there's a little bit more wind, uh, but uh, there's more chance to see whales. Sometimes when it's not a good year, sometime mid-March, the whales are gone, like this year, for example. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then what was the other question? Uh, um, do they calf during that? Oh, time? yeah. Good. Or when? Yeah, we don't know. I mean, we assume that they're calving because I, because I mean, our experience is seeing small calves and larger calves, all of them. I mean, during the season, right? And I don't think blue whale all calves at the same time. I think it's the range, it goes like for two, three months. 
Um, and I don't think we'll ever see that to prove it. So <laughs> you have to trust me uh, on that. It's just like we assume um, because, because some, of, some of the calves are small and um, I don't see why a whale would come from far away all the way there just with the calf. I mean, uh, it doesn't make sense to me, but who knows? Um, Dan's asking, how long after birth till a baby has eggs in its feces? Oh my God. We, we, could, not uh, we could not work or analyze feces of calf because they don't, the, their feces, it's kind of liquid because they feed on milk. So yeah, we will never know that unless we're able to, you know, <laughs> to capture. But I think the parasites, uh, endoparasites are coming from the food. So calves probably don't have parasites until they start to feed. And then another question is do, 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 from Terry. Has there been a noticeable impact in the Gulf due to large scale fishing of krill for human supplements? Wow. Are you assuming that they're harvesting the krill in the Gulf? Um, they, it's, I think so. Is, is there a, is there, are people collecting krill in the Gulf? I, maybe that's what Terry's question is. I think it's, it's, it's done in the Antarctic, but I, I doubt it's in the Gulf. Maybe they, they have, they have studied it or they have planned it, but I don't think it's, it's, it's done right now. No, I would be very surprised. And then I think this is our last question. Um, and I think you might've answered it, um, but it's from Dan. It says, are babies born with parasites on board um, or could they pick them up in the birth canal? So I think you said it was once they start feeding, right? Yeah, well, maybe, I, I mean, we don't know, right? But because we cannot open the well, kill the well, open it and check. But I mean, logically, the, the element parasites comes from, you know, from the, the, the food uh, cycle. Maybe the, the eggs are developed in the krill, but then uh, only to a certain point and then on other things, but, and they're different type of helminths, uh, parasites. But yeah, probably the, the, the cat, cat, I don't know with, with animals, you know, like, like cows and, and sheep, it would be easy to check that, right? I'm thinking, I, 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 I would think it's the same thing with whales, but we don't know. But I assume it's, they get, they started to get parasites by, by when they're feeding. And then uh, this is actually gonna be the last question. Um, are orcas preying on the same blue whale, uh, blue whales as humpbacks and gray whales? Um, if I remember, uh, just a side note, if I remember there are, Orcas, uh, there was a video of an orca attacking uh, blue whales, but in Australia, is that something that could happen in the Gulf or on our side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, th there is a, a movie that was uh, a documentary that was filmed off Cabo on the West Coast in 1977 by National Geographic. I don't remember who filmed that. And there's a group of 20, 25 uh, orca attacking a whale. And the whale has missed one, one full side of his body and still, still swimming. It's, uh, yeah. And killer whales are in the Gulf. And there's, there's also uh, a match between a group of killer whales seen in the Gulf and also of LA. Uh, killer whales move around uh, for sure. And, and Almost every year I see killer whales at least one day, but this year I didn't, I did, this and last year I, I, we didn't. But yeah, they attack any kind of whales that are around. And, but to attack the large blue whale, they better be uh, uh, in large number <clears throat> because you can see females with calves, the, the old females or females that already had calf that has experience they have a lot of marking of, of killer whales on their 
flukes and also on their back, on their on dorsal fin. So they're able to to um, to defend themselves. Maybe not their calf, but at least themselves. Um, so yeah. Awesome. And uh, with that, I have to say thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this month's ACS. Um, everyone, and especially you, Diane, for your presentation. It was a a very informative, and I loved every single part of it. You know, a lot of great information of blue whales that, to be honest, I didn't even know. So thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for uh, joining us. I really appreciate everyone joining us for tonight's um, presentation. And hopefully we'll see you next month's presentation. If I remember, it will be uh, the president of ACS National. So thank you uh, so much. Um, I'm seeing all these, uh, thank you so much, um, Diane in the chat. So it was an amazing talk. And if, uh, oh, sorry. Can I ask one question personally? Sure. Um, for anyone, uh, cause we, we have a, a wide range of participants for our meetings. Do you have any suggestions for any young students um, who want to get into whale research or research in general? Any suggestions or tips to them? This is just a question like that I like to ask um, our, present, our presenters. So any tips or tricks that you have? Yeah, I think it, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, follow your instinct. <laughs> In the sense, like, uh, for me, for example, okay, obviously 30 years ago, it was much easier. Right? There was no, not so many people studying whales, but I, I decided to come to Mexico to do my master. And everybody was telling me, you're going the wrong way. The Mexican are coming to Canada to study, not the opposite way. I said, well, the blue whales I want to study are in Mexico. And obviously, uh, that was not easy, different, different culture, different language, blah, blah, blah. But it was very exciting. It was an adventure. And that lead, because I was so passionate about, about, about what I was doing, lead me to, to get a price and then to get a job. Uh, so follow your instinct. If, if, I, if I follow what people told me, I would never have come down, you know? Other things is uh, um, you know, like I have volunteer that you know write to me. For example, they want to participate. It really depends on your on your uh, uh, your your and not ambition. Your 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 dedication. Are you really? Is it really what you want to do? When you ask for you know. Uh, a volunteer or, or to start a, a thesis or a master, if you're really into it, you show it, it, it will help you for sure, for sure. So awesome. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, great words, follow your, your instincts and, you know, you know, really know if you're dedicated to it. So awesome. Um, thank you everyone once again for joining us. And I hope to see your beautiful faces in the future 